Hello and good evening. Thank you for coming. I um, have the pleasure to introduce Matthew. Um, he will give us a talk today about tangible aesthetics. Um, Matthew is a professor for inter um, Intermedia um, Arts um, and a, pro a professor at Florida State University. Or did, did a, ah, Central Florida. Central Florida. Yeah. There's so many in America. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he's a Fulbright um, scholar to Austria. And by this, I think I would like to pass it over to you. I'm very excited to have you here, and thank you for coming. Sure. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I am Matthew Mosher, and I'm going to talk to you today a bit about tangible aesthetics and how I see them relating to this idea of the machine cult. Um, I teach in a games and interactive media program at University of Central Florida. Our students do game design and web design, and here I'm working for a bit at Fachhochschule Salzburg in the Multimedia Art Program. Uh, but my research is primarily in interactive sculpture. So I make uh, physical forms that people can engage with and can touch and feel and listen to that often respond with light or audio. So I'm going to uh, give you a look at some of my projects and I'm going to go into a pretty like deep dive of some of them so that you can see like the behind the scenes look as you will for how they work and how they function which might be uh, particularly interesting if you yourself are a creative person or a programmer of any kind. Um, and I, I have to give a little disclaimer with the description of the talk if you if you read that I talked about uh, embodiment and um, Martin Heidegger's theories of phenomenology and when I wrote the description, it was uh, before I got here and realized that Heidegger was a Nazi as well. That, that kind of came out relatively recently. Um, so I, I'd like to separate a little bit out the, the phenomenology from the Nazism with, with Heidegger, right? So uh, Nazis are pretty heinous people. But thankfully, the theory he developed on phenomenology is not really linked to genetics or white supremacy or fascism or anything like that. So I'm going to talk more about um, just the phenomenology and then the people who have developed those ideas further afterwards, like uh, Merleau Ponty and Paul Duresh. Okay. And I'm going to start with a very recent piece called Kronko, which is a meditation aid, really. It's a sculpture that helps with meditation. Does anyone here meditate? Or have you meditated? Some. A few. Good. Can I ask you, what is the hardest part about meditating? Clearing your brain. Clearing your brain. Yeah. Anything else? Keep it, keeping it for a while? Yeah. Hold it. Hold it. Like, you get it clear and then, like, trying to hold that for a little bit. Uh-huh. Not falling asleep. Yeah. <laughs> Staying awake. Good. For me, uh, another hard aspect of meditation is that it, you, it's very hard to tell if you're doing it right. Right? Like, you, it's hard to tell, like, am I, am I getting anywhere with this? Um, and you're, you're meditating that you might lose your focus or you, you, you lose the clarity and then trying to get the clarity back. Right? So, uh, I wanted to make a, a sculpture or a tool that would help you remain focused as long as you could. Um, and there's devices out there now that can measure your brain waves, EEG headsets, uh, that can tell you if you're calm or relaxed or if you're stressed uh, or how focused you are. So, uh, this screen is, is kind of interesting. It has these bars here that have RGB LEDs in them, and they're facing the wall. So this whole thing is like off the wall a bit, and then it projects light back onto it. And these lights change based on the data it's receiving from this EEG headset. So I can show you a little bit of a video of how this works. You can see the lights kind of like shift around a little bit. There's a lot of colors. And if you're doing a, a mindfulness meditation, right, where you're just trying to like relax your mind and not think about anything but being mindful of your surroundings, um, 
this is very traditional meditation. We can measure that actually pretty easily with your alpha waves in your head. Um, the problem with that, though, is that alpha waves respond very much to your eyes being open or closed. So if your eyes are open, it's actually very hard to detect your alpha waves. And if they're closed, it's easy. And as a visual artist, that's problematic, right? I can't uh, make something that I want you to look at to help you with meditation if that blocks the sensing mechanism. So this, this piece works with focus instead. So I'm measuring your beta and theta waves, which give me a, a sense of if you're very focused on something or if you're distracted. So when you get distracted, uh, the, you get this multicolored effect. But if you're focused, all the colors become one and it becomes uniform. It doesn't become uniform in a necessarily particular color but it will all become the same color. And so you can use this then as a tool if you're meditating watching this to see how much focus you have. And it uses a, a flocking algorithm. If you've written some code, this is a great like exercise uh, to learn about physics and particles. And a typical flocking algorithm looks like this, where you've got these like voids or shapes floating around in space. And they're trying to maintain cohesion with each other and a certain amount of distance between their neighbors and um, a certain alignment or similar direction. And so what I do with this piece, instead of flocking through this XY space like this uh, demo does, I'm flocking through color space. The LEDs are fixed in position, but their colors are changing. And so to make this a little bit more clear, I can show you these little animation samples where the overall color space is like trending towards itself or away from itself. Can you see that? Great. Uh, and so these were, these were just done in a, like a JavaScript language as sketches for the Cronco. So how did I get to all this? My background is actually in furniture design. Um, and I did my undergraduate work at the Rhode Island School of Design in furniture and then my MFA in intermedia at Arizona State. And intermedia is a term that we use to describe artwork that does not fit into a predefined category. It's not printmaking, it's not painting, uh, it's not necessarily sculpture. It's a combination of all these things. And so this Past work in furniture really uh, like defines the methodology that I use on these interactive tangible forms. So uh, Secrets of the Dark, I'll show you next, is a piece I made this interface for it with um, Purple Heart and Red Heart, these very kind of exotic woods, as an enclosure for a game track device. Now, game track. normally looks like this. It's a game that was made for PlayStation and Xbox back in the day. And they had this really terrible, uh, unfortunate market circumstance. They released GameTrack like very shortly before the Wii game system came out, and the Wii system was way better <laughs> than this. The GameTrack was only designed to work with this one uh, golfing game, and it just couldn't compete with Wii which works out really nicely for us artists because you can get these things on eBay for like 10 bucks uh, and they're very easy to hack. Um, but it's a really cool interface system to use for artwork. So you've got two joysticks and the, the really interesting aspect of them is that they have this additional string element which is a Z axis. So you have X and Y on the joystick and then the Z. And with the game you're supposed to use these gloves and they clip on there and it's, it's very awkward. <laughs> so I replaced those with knobs, right? So it's, it's a more intuitive thing. And I use this to drive a um, visual effects processor and an FM synthesizer. So then my other question for you is what, 
What was one of the like most meaningful art experiences you've had? If you can remember a particular one. For me, it's always when, when um, I am generally more moved by performance art than mm -hmm. by any static media medium. Uh, so whenever there's people involved doing a thing, I feel like I understand it a lot better than when there's no people there. Great. Yeah. So like this, this very like human element mm -hmm. to it and it changes over time, right? And you can see this evolution. Cool. Yeah. yeah. I would say when I discover something new and art ah, okay. be somewhere else, then I don't have a specific one because it's always evolving or I discover things. More I get surprised, or less I get surprised. Right, great. So, so when you have a, a new experience or something yeah. like this. Yeah, good. Any others? Yeah. I think some art pieces are really give some kind of very strong transition or relation to the original art piece. Okay. Like So something that captures your attention or some familiarity with the, the people behind the work. Yeah. Great. Um, so uh, the, these things, I will try to work back to this idea of embodiment, right? So um, in particularly like the involvement of people, the involvement of time, a new experience. Um, all have to do with this, this notion of embodiment or phenomenology. So Paul Duresh, one of the people that expanded on Heidegger's work, describes embodiment as um, this, this notion that, that uh, phenomena occur in real time and in real space. Uh, and that aspect of things happening physically are what allows something to be embodied. Uh, and which, which begs the question, isn't everything we do embodied then, right? Like everything we do happens in real time, in real space. Uh, but we can see some things pushing more into physicality or, or less. So an example I like to use, we, could, we can imagine like these different scenarios. Um, you can imagine the experience of like walking through a hedge maze, right? And trying to find your way through this. And then you can imagine the same experience, um, but in a video game, right? As you're like navigating through a maze on a screen or like drawing, trying to figure out a maze on paper. And they're, they're quite different experiences physically, even though the idea is the same in all three, right? And as you get more embodied, the closer you get to actually walking through the maze, the more, um, the more meaningful that experience is going to be. You're going to feel very good about yourself for successfully completing the hedge maze. You might feel OK about completing the computer game maze. And the paper maze, where you can see the whole thing all at once, it's like, yeah, that's great. But I could kind of tell that I was going to be able to do this from the beginning, right? Um, so Duresh will say that the, the quality of an experience that allows us to make it meaningful is how embodied it is, how much physicality there is in a system. And so as artists and designers, we can, we can take this idea and go two ways with it. We can either say, OK, well, we want to put a person then completely into our digital work, if we're a digital artist, through something like VR. Right? So we can make a VR experience that really puts someone into a new, a new place. Or we can try to build an experience around the person, right? With either many screens or large projections or um, things in the environment that they can touch and feel and will respond to them will also give you a sense of an embodied digital experience. It's tricky because the, the normal mode for our digital experiences are on a screen in front of a computer, right? Which is not a terribly in embodied environment. So what can we do? to amplify this, this normal computer experience to make it more engaging. 
So this, this is some, an idea that I'm constantly trying to work with uh, in my artwork. So step one, you make a weird interface. Step two, you add projections and sound to it. And so in this piece, it starts out with this grayscale. There's a little flame effect. And I built it to try to reward people for taking more extreme gestures. The more physical you are with the interface, the more interesting the visuals and sounds become. And I've noticed people will engage with this in two different ways. Some people will try to like, listen to the sounds and make a particular sound or, or note with it. Other people will watch the visuals and try to make a particular pattern or design. But both are happening at the same time. And I do this on a, a very large scale, right? So we can project this on a building uh, and have it be a really fun and engaging experience for people. OK, so a uh, different project, what we have lost, what we have gained. I don't know about you. I go to a lot of uh, EDM shows. And uh, this, can, this can either be like a very good or very bad experience. When you go to these shows, sometimes you've got a, a DJ or performer who's on there doing their computer work, right? Because the computer is almost always involved. And they're playing their DJ show. And I could be playing an EDM show right now. And it would look like this. I might do this. I might do this. And it's like, OK, so it's not like the most performative thing. It's not like playing a keyboard or a guitar on stage that's really like evocative to, to watch. So I, I was thinking, like, how could I make a system for the EDM DJ uh, that would be familiar to them, that they would understand, but they would also be much more engaging for the audience? So I just took a, a drum pad-like device but made it much bigger. So now you're doing these gestures instead of these gestures. OK, it's the same thing. So this is a uh, spandex screen stretched over a metal grid. And I'm tracking the depth of pressure with an infrared system like a Kinect, and then translating that into MIDI data. But uh, I'm an artist too, right? So I can't just make a large MIDI interface. That's, that's cool, but it's not terribly interesting. Um, so I rear project it with these mouths, and this woman sings to you when you push on them. And it asks this really interesting question, which is what are the liberties that we're willing to take Um, what are the liberties we're willing to take with the digital representation of another person's body? Okay, so people feel very fine like walking up to this and pushing on the mouths and it's cool and they get excited But then you think like would I actually do this in real life? Like would I walk up to someone and touch their mouth? No, it, it, that'd be awkward, right? So there's this divide like as soon as we digitify something that allows me to, to do things that I wouldn't do normally, right? And we're getting to a point now with robotics and stuff that we have to ask, like, at what point is this no longer OK, right? Like, when, when does this become confrontational or, or offensive to a machine? I also do some performance work. And 
here I'm using the weight of water to drive the synthesizer. There's three scales. Each scale has its own voice. And I'm using my mouth to change the pressure in the bottles, which will affect how quickly the water level changes between them. So there's bottles on the scales and bottles on these like stair structures. And the water level in each pair of bottles is always trying to seek a constant level. So if one's high and one's low, the water level will change like this to be the same. Or if they're this way, they'll go like this. Um, and all this is d this is done with uh, FSRs, actually, an Arduino, Max MSP, this this kind of stuff. And I'm thinking uh, about balance here, right? Obviously, it scales in, in the the weight of water. Um, it relates a bit to the the Kronko piece earlier, where you're trying to like seek this like mental equilibria. Uh, a lot of my work has to do with like stability. Seeking stability. I do collaborations too. Um, I worked with curator Julie Akerley on this dance piece. We had six performers. And here in the still, we were, we were also thinking about mental stillness and, and what does a quiet mind look like versus an unquiet mind. And, and what are things that distract us from having a quiet mind. So we asked each of our performers to go through their social media feeds um, and to come up with a series of movements based on their social media, right? This is easy for dancers to do. It'd be challenging for like me or normal people to do. Um, and we use social media as, as this like identifier as a thing that often distracts us or that can make us unquiet. And you, you see social media feeds from other people and all the amazing things they're doing in their life. And it makes you feel inadequate because what did I do this weekend? Well, I had some beers, uh, and that was it, right? So we, they came up with a sequence of movements based on their social media. And then I wrote a system that would, uh, using a neural network, quasi-randomly, quasi-probabilistically send out pulses. And each of the dancers has a cell phone strapped to their arm or leg somewhere that's receiving these pulses, and it just vibrates. So the cues for this piece are delivered by a system in a way that the audience can't actually see, right? So usually if you have a dance film, the cues for it you can hear because they're, they're associated with the audio or you see them with the lights. But here we're sending the cues through this neural network and it's also going to the sound design for the piece. So everything is driven by this, this machine that's like controlling the dancers' lives. And here's some video from that.
and this was particularly interesting to me because it was kind of like a reversal of our understanding of, of hybrid systems. Most of the time, if we have an interactive system, there's a human putting input into a computer system and getting some, some visual or audio feedback. Whereas with this, there's a digital system putting input into a human activity that's creating this very human output. Um, so it's, it's quite different. It's like the opposite. Um, of what we would expect from uh, an interactive system like that. Swing score is a sculpture installation with these pendulums. And you're invited to walk up and swing them. They make these cool patterns in the sand, and they play this audio. This piece I, I did with uh, Cecily Culver, who's a sculptor. And it, it works with hall sensors. Each tip of the pendulums has a magnet in them, and there's just a little sensor reading the magnetic field underneath. When you move the pendulum away, it, it triggers the audio files. And the audio is from the, um, the wine glasses. When you have your finger and you make the noise. Because it's the same motion as what the pendulums do. Tributaries of Our Lost Affinity was a, a site-specific installation I did with Tony Ober. We had a, uh, in Phoenix, a gallery that was made out of a shipping container that they had like put nice walls inside of. So it's a very like long but narrow space. Um, and I built these, this, we had like zero budget for this uh, piece. So I made these paper cones that kind of look like barnacles and they're light sensitive and you could shine a flashlight or your cell phone light on these things. It would feed into a synthesizer that Tony designed and play you some audio. Uh, and this, this piece references this really odd phenomenon, maybe you're familiar with, where you're waiting in line or at the bus, um, and you, you might have this like momentary, this brief second of boredom. And immediately, you take out your phone, and you're looking at it, and you're like, ooh, updates, notifications, and I'm doing stuff on here, but I don't actually mean to do anything with this. I'm looking, I'm searching for something, right? I, I want something, I don't know what it is, entertainment. But there's no, there's no, there's no task, there's no real thing to find in this, this activity. And so like that, this piece, you can search it with your phone, flashlight, but you're not ever going to find anything. It's just going to like bloop and bleep at you. And I think that this is like the, the piece I have that's the most related to this machine cult because this is like this is our machine cult here, the phones. I can show you what it does too.
So the form of the cones kind of references barnacles, and the audio has this kind of wet, bubbly kind of thing, and that's, that's just a thematic, thematic component to the piece. We really like this, but again, it's made out of paper. It's not very durable. Uh, so we wanted to make a, a new version of it that would be portable that we could show more places easier. And so we teamed up with the ceramicist Daniel Wood, who made this wonderful like sea anemone thing. The technologies are almost the same. The audio tracks are the same. Each pod has a light sensor, a photoresistor that's detecting the light, and has its own voice in the track. This is particularly cool to me because it's self-contained. There's no computer. Um, it's running off an Arduino and a, a wave shield. And it has 12 voice polyphony. So you can see how it works here. We've got a bunch of photoresistors. They feed into multiplexers. Microprocessor determines what are the 10 greatest light differences that the piece detects with the, compared to the environment. And then play the tracks associated with those. So the nice thing about this version, too, is that it can work by shining light onto it or by creating shadows over the, the pods. And it's doing a, a like running averaging on the ambient environment so it knows what to compare the light levels to. All right, I've just got a couple more pieces for you. Uh, Tranquility was a spacecraft, a would-be spacecraft, uh, that I made in Arizona. And I did this in uh, around 2012 in the United States when the the, our president at the time, Barack Obama, canceled Constellation, which was the next great American space program. Uh, and in the same year, the shuttle, the space shuttle, was put into retirement. So Constellation was canceled, shuttle was retired. We had no, as Americans, we had no plan on how to like put people into space. And to this day, we still rely on the Russian Soyuz rockets to send people to like the International Space Station if we want to do that. Um, if you've kept up with uh, any of the international news, you might know that America and Russia don't have the best working relationship. Um, <laughs> so it was, it was disconcerting to me that, that we had given up like all of our, our space exploration, our human space exploration research. And so I made this, this piece in kind of response to that. It's a mock space rover. It's solar powered. Um, and you can use this to drive around. It doesn't have windows. It has a camera on the front and a screen inside that you can use to, to steer it. It's built on an electric wheelchair, actually, for its, for its drive system. And it has this very large speaker engine. Now, when it's idle in a gallery just sitting there, uh, I had it connected to this, this app um, called Cantus, which tracks all the satellites that are around the Earth. And it knows your GPS location from your phone. And whenever a satellite passes over your location, it just makes this like bloop, which is kind of cool. This happens remarkably frequently. Like, we have hundreds of thousands of satellites around the planet. And so, uh, every few minutes, it would chi this audio would like chime, and it would make this kind of like soundtrack of of satellites passing overhead. But you can also get inside of it, right? So the solar panel is actually the hatch to let you get in. You climb up these engine vents as a ladder, and you lay down horizontally inside of this. The screen then comes down, and you can watch where you're going as you drive around. Here's a detail of the hatch closed and open. 
Um, and like that, that wasn't complicated enough. I had to, I had to add more to it. So when you're driving this around, it doesn't use the Cantus app. You again wear an EEG headset. Now, 2012 EEG headsets are not what they are today. Um, and this one could really just measure your anxiety. And it would adjust the volume of the track, or not the volume, like the position of the track that it was playing when you're driving it around. And it's playing a recording of the audio that was created by STS-135, which was the very last space shuttle launch. Um, so this, it's a very dramatic recording, right? There's like this very large explosion, uh, rockets lifting off, it's very loud. And so if you're, if you're stressed out, it plays the beginning of this track and it's just like um, and it sounds like a rocket going off. But if you can relax, which might be hard when you're listening to this noise, uh, but if you can relax, it plays the end of the track as the rocket is going off to the ISS and it just sounds like So it's, it's a nice little commentary on the, the, at the time, the current state of American space exploration. And I think this was like as embodied a system I could possibly make. Yeah. Oh, OK. I only have one more. Um, if These Walls Could Speak is a, a system for recording and preserving your memories is audio files into physical objects. So I'm sure everyone's familiar with a diary as a way to like track your thoughts or to like to think about your day or reflect on your life. And it's very chronological. You go page to page through time. And that's great. Um, but a lot of times people have things that they want to preserve a memory of, but it's not really appropriate to put it in a diary, right? So you might have souvenirs from travels or um, objects from like a kid's growth that are important, like old toys, any kind of like heirloom or memorabilia that has a particular um, significance to you. Wouldn't it be great if there was a way that you could record that significance into the object itself so it would remember that story? So each of these rocks um, are tagged with an RFID tag. If you pick one up and you put it over here, the speaker will play you the story that that rock knows. If this rock does not know a story, it's a fresh or new rock, it will ask you to tell it a story, which it will record with a microphone here. So you can create this nonlinear archive. And this was actually inspired by my mother, who, when she travels, she picks up rocks wherever she goes, and she brings them home, and she's got this like great rock collection on the mantle. But now if you ask her, like, Mom, where's this rock from? She's like, uh, I don't know, because they're all rocks, and they all look the same. <laughs> right? So I was like, wouldn't it be great if we could, we could record or re remember where these rocks were from? So I made this. And uh, while I'm here, I'm working on a new version of this piece that you can use any object with, not just rocks, to record stories into. So it actually does work. And so this is, this is my take on integrating um, some digital technologies with visual arts and how we can use the tangibility of objects to create embodied experiences for viewers or participants in our systems. Questions? Um, great presentation. I think you do great work. Uh, 
very interesting. I was also shocked when I found out about Heidegger's background. Yeah. I also found out about it while I was here in Salzburg. Yeah, so great. I was like, <laughs> Melo Ponti it is. Um, one thing I was wondering about if you, um, I, I'm sure you've thought about it, but if you also have a design vision for it, um, and it especially came to my mind with your first project with the meditation wall, where um, the machine also speaks back. So you have your focus or lack of focus and the machine um, or the the wall shows you how much focus or lack of focus you have and that might actually you know make it harder for you to clear your mind because you're thinking ah shit i'm not focusing yeah, yeah. and same with like getting into the space like the rocket and yeah. having that kind of feedback is there a way to design for the unexpectedness of whatever the, sh the machine causes the human interacting with it to do Yes, I, I, th I think there absolutely is, particularly with, with like the first piece, and that's, that's, as it is now, it's strictly a visual piece, right? But uh, there's definitely an opportunity there to have an audio component to it as well. And like with meditation, it would be rather straightforward to have like a, a, a binaural system that could play tones, you know, that would help bring you back into focus, right? Um, or into some other mental state, whatever was desired of, of the system. So, yeah, I, th I think there's there's certainly windows for that, depending on what your goal is, right? Like, if that's what you're trying to do, absolutely. Um, with the space one, I was I was honestly more trying to create agitation with people because I was myself was agitated about the situation. So I, it it was designed to not be easy to use, right? Because as an artist, I can do that. As a designer, that would be a bad idea. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I, th I think you can drive the machine back into the, the person as well. Do you think, do you think, do you think um, that um, there are strategies that you can uh, take away from particular designs and apply to more? Because now you're talking about specifically here, yeah. I could add audio yeah, yeah. or here it's meant to be uh, disruptive. But do you think there's um, general design strategies that you can apply that take into account the fact that the machine talks back and the human reacts to that again? I, I would have to think about that more to give you like a really well thought out <laughs> response. But I think that um, by, by like looking at, at the principles of, of interaction design that yes, like certainly um, it could be, be done through um, Yeah, through through really thinking about what what your feedback options are for the system you're designing and how you're mapping those to the inputs, right? And then if you can create a really nice like uh, coding or pairing between the inputs, the the mapping and the feedback, it should create this loop, right, of conversation between person and object, and then object and in person. <coughs> uh, hello. I uh, also really liked your pieces, but I have some questions. Sure. Um, you said that uh, with the last piece, um, the um, how was it called? If these walls could speak, that you used RFID tr uh, yeah. trackers to do this, uh, and I thought, I mean, it, it's a kind of practical way to do it. But have you thought about using something like? object recognition for yes. because it, it would like be amazing to not rely on RFID tags but to just have this object and have it recognized and then add this digital story yeah so in in the the current one i'm working on i i looked at like ar systems right for for 3d object recognition um and that it's absolutely a possibility the issue that, I, that, that leads me to like NFC or, I, or RFID um, has to do with the type of objects that you might want to track. And if you're tracking rigid things, like three-dimensional things or rocks or toys or something like that, yeah, it's, it's fine. But then if you want to 
um, track like clothing or shoes or something that's a stuffed animal that changes its shape, the, the, I don't think the AR is, is there yet in terms of being able to detect an object that has an amorphous shape, right? So um, you need some other kind of physical QR code or, or RFID tag or something to, to associate the object with a database. Yeah. And I have a second question. Mm -hmm. Um, because I think the space piece is a little bit older, yeah. uh, wasn't it? What's your position on space traveling or kind of the American things that are going on right now? Because I think it's quite positive having these private companies, but has your perspective changed or...? Uh, no. <laughs> But, um, largely because I, I'm still not convinced that we have like a solid plan for putting humans in space and, and that I think we're doing fantastic stuff with like robotic space exploration, sure, th and that's great. Um, and the, the commercial aspect I, I think is, is, a, is a, a logical thing for, for NASA to pursue to offload some of the short space travel trips to these companies. Um, but like for, for me, my dream, right, is that As humans, we become an interplanetary species. I'd love for us to be on Mars uh, in some kind of capacity. And I think uh, it'll, it'll take a much more concerted effort to, to do that than perhaps what Elon Musk is able to do with just his, his great wealth, right? Um, but in, in terms of the like ISS missions and satellite launching, like sure, yeah, let, let, let the private companies do that. and. Let the government companies like the, the European Space Agency and NASA do the further reach stuff. Hello. Uh, in the installation, what we have lost, uh, you worked with a singer to uh, make uh, tone, mm -hmm. or is it just tone? And if yes, why? And which temperament? And Uh, yeah. Did you have a reflection about it? Yeah, that? yeah. Uh, that's a great question. So Ashley uh, is a singer in a punk band, uh, in like kind of a, an improvisational punk band. So I asked her to sing a scale, and you heard what I got, and it's not exactly a scale. <laughs> um, but she, she is so expressive in her singing, and her, her like facial features, are, she's got like a chipped tooth, and it's just, it works very well aesthetically I think and you can you could if you really wanted to hack together a song with it um, and it, at one point in time I actually re-recorded it with a with like a choir singer who was very good and it was a perfect scale and I, I ran that through it uh, on a few occasions but it, it just it didn't have this kind of it lost a bit of the human quality to it right um, I felt that people could connect with Ashley more because it's not perfect. Um, which given what I, was, what I was going for with digital representation of the like, physical other, worked for me. Um, so yeah, so I, I've, I've tried doing it in a more precise way, right? And, and with um, the other singer, you could play Mary Had a Little Lamb and Twinkle Twinkle Little Star and, and these things on it, but But even more, um, not less precise way. Yeah. Why, why haven't you yeah. Why haven't you choose a less precise way, uh, as you ah, say? Ah, okay. Yeah. Um. That's a good question. <laughs> 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 uh, I'm not sure. I, I the the simplicity of the the oohs and the ahs and the os worked at the time, and it's kind of it. It matches the sensuality of, of the material and, and like pushing someone's mouth. But yeah, sure, I, I could try it with, with some more chaotic sounds <laughs> as well. Thanks. Are there any more questions? Please, please, please. Thank you. Uh, I was like regarding to the first art piece you showed us, mm -hmm. I was wondering if it, um, if it would be possible if you only Uh, change the saturation of the color, if that would be enough to demand the attention to get back focus? Yes, yeah. So in, in EEG 
meditation studies, people have done uh, that very thing, like a red-blue shift as just mm -hmm. the only indication of focus. Um, and that works very well, too. Um, for me, in thinking about it as an art installation, I wanted it to do more than that as well. So the, the thinking about it as representative of, of like chaos versus focus, right? Like the multicolors versus a single color was more um, of a metaphor for what your brain was going through than the strict red-blue color shift for as an indication, right? If I were making uh, an application or a design object, that might be better mm -hmm. um, to, to be clear about your state, right? Um, but, for, but for like a museum piece or a gallery piece, I think having this added layer of movement to it helps with the engagement. It also makes it such that uh, only one person can engage with that piece at a time, right? Because there's only one headset. Um, but because of the movement and the pattern shift, it's also interesting to watch as a spectator. So I can, you can have many people watching one person engaging with the piece and have it still be an interesting experience, which is an important thing for, for like a public display, less so for a private display, right? So again, where, where a more simple feedback mechanism might work uh, in a private setting, in a public setting, I want it to be more dynamic. Mm -hmm. Because maybe in a private setting, <coughs> when, when you try to uh, meditate, it maybe distracts you by moving, like by changing the hue of mm -hmm. the color. Because like I read that the saturation of a color is um, demands the attention and the hue is not so much important for the attention. So in, in the context of meditating, um, I thought it might be better to get in the state of meditation when it's just like um, more silent. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank I, you. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Just um, thank you for your presentation. Just a quick question about the installation in the container. In the mm -hmm. um, yeah, I was wondering since you created this object like in ceramics um, and you use it for uh, for the sensor, so each of these containers, let's say, um, how to say, um, reacts singularly uh, to the light. Um, why not using them for sound as well? Because I was thinking they look like resonators to me. Yeah. <laughs> and they have sp probably specific sizes and you could also rather play some, because the sound you play, I don't know how you recorded it. It was, I don't know. It's not recorded, it's, it's completely synthesized. Yeah. yeah. So maybe bringing also back, I don't know, vibration into. Yeah. The, uh, yeah. Yeah, that, that's, um, it's a very good idea and uh, if I were to do the piece again, I would consider that. Yeah, I don't know if, sure. it, if they can actually vibrate independently, honestly, for how it's made, but right. maybe... I, I don't know. We, did, we didn't yeah. try it um, because we just kind of had this, this vision for this thing and, and went with it. But then, yeah, in looking at it afterwards, yeah. it, it does look like the, the little cups might be able to be resonators. I don't know if the ceramic is too thick or denser or something, but... Yeah, it warrants exploration, sure. One more question? Yeah, please. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't be the same without you, Marius. <laughs> how, how would you like, okay. So, um, th the, the question that in the beginning you asked us what kind of uh, art experience we had and what kind of um, things are important and I always uh, no I, I also thought about that and I'm not uh, no how do I put this so my question is now what makes an art piece really an art piece and I want <laughs> I want to <laughs> I want to give an example like from talk about um, my experience with that is and uh, I stopped at some point call myself an artist because um, I put a lot of 
time into solving problems and creating tools, but not into art pieces. And when I saw your um, your list of, of projects, I, I think some of them maybe are more like um, gadgets and some others are more um, artistic. And these, these questions that you posed in the beginning will not uh, like this, this sensation or this, th this idea of a wow, that was a good piece effect did not come with all of, of, yeah. of the pieces you showed. So how, d and the reason why I think this is true is because some brains are just uh, wired more technically and some others are in, I don't know which way, wired more artistically so d how do you deal with these questions and do you put more energy into developing solutions like the technical aspect or do you put a lot of energy into an artistic concept and or is this not important for you it it really depends on um the piece in the project i usually in terms of my process, like I usually have um, an idea for an experience or uh, a message that I want to convey, and then I think about what are the materials and tools that I could use that would that would best help me towards that goal. And sometimes it's what I've shown you today was like highly technical um, stuff that involves a lot of programming and circuitry and stuff like that. But uh, there's like a whole other side of my work that doesn't right. That's very just like sculpture. Um, stuff. So uh, it it really depends on, for me, like what what is my goal with the piece, and what do I want people to get out of it, and that will determine what I need to do to to make it right. So in these ones, it's a lot of coding and a lot of programming. In other ones, it might be a lot of casting or wood carving or or something else. That's a it's a perfect note to end this talk. Thank you very much. Thank you.